the future. <laughs> We're closer to Cleopatra's life than Cleopatra was to the building of the Great Pyramids. That's insane. We think of like dinosaurs all at the same time, but we're closer to the Tyrannosaurus being alive than the Tyrannosaurus was to the Stegosaurus being alive. Whoa. Yeah, man. You're like blowing my mind with all of this. What about um, Pablo Picasso could have seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in theaters? (laughs) No, no. I always think of him being alive in, like, the 1600s. I don't yeah, know why. Yeah, like, quaint provincial France. No, but he died in the, the 70s. No, I, I think he was alive in Belle's time. <laughs> <laughs> he was from Beauty and the Beast, wasn't he? Or there was a time, like a brief period in time, where Abraham Lincoln could have sent a fax to a samurai. Fax machines and samurai and Abraham Lincoln like coexisted for about two, three years. No, it's weird. This yeah. is too much. Or Han Solo has been famous for longer than France has been guillotine free. They were using the guillotine pretty long. <laughs> I knew that. That is crazy. I don't I don't like this. This is too much time space continuum. Whoa, man. Time, Whoa, man. man. But today's not even one of our spacey no. episodes. And, like, time hasn't existed for me for, like, three weeks now. No. Today was the first day I put on, like, real clothes. I'm wearing jeans right now. What? It sucks. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to undo the top button. Because... There you go, because it's a party. Because it's a party. And by party, we mean podcast. Podcast party. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of I Love This you should too. And we are a member of the Alberta Podcast Network, which is locally grown and community supported. And my name is Indy Feel the Rhythm Randawa, and with me is Samantha Lucky Egg Hees. <laughs> I wondered if you were going to be Lucky Egg or if I was going to be Lucky Egg. You knew egg. one of us would be yeah, the Lucky Egg? I thought so. Well, if that's not a good enough hint for you, today we are going to be talking about cool runnings from 1993 it was my pick last week so i chose this movie from my childhood that i assumed i really loved but i haven't actually seen in wow probably more than 10 years 15 20 who knows (laughs) i still knew every word to it you did and samantha saw it for the first time so we'll be discussing that today and today will be a spoiler filled episode so, so spoilers. if you haven't seen it go watch it what are you waiting for but before we get into talking all about cool runnings we want to thank one of our sponsors for today and that is the edmonton community foundation and their podcast the well endowed podcast which is hosted by andrew paul and elizabeth bonkink and produced by lisa pruden It explores the impact of passionate people who are working to make Edmonton a strong, vibrant city to live in. The Edmonton Community Foundation helps people create endowment funds, and the podcast tells the stories of how those endowment funds intersect with the community. And you can find out more about them at thewellendowedpodcast.com, or you can download and subscribe to their podcast, wherever you are listening to this one. Well, Samantha, how are you feeling today? Are you ready to talk Cool Runnings? I am feeling significantly better than the last time we podcasted, so I am ready. Indy, how are you? I am feeling very Olympic today. Are you feeling very Mm -hmm. Olympic? You're wearing no Canadian gear, but I know it's in your heart. No, today my heart is Jamaican because (laughs) I love Jamaica, (laughs) and Jamaica loves me. I could just do this whole podcast in quotes from this movie. I know you could. I I would never, ever challenge you to it (laughs) because I know that you could do it. And then I would just sit here stunned in amazement as you you performed this podcast in quotes. (laughs) Well, I guess we have to start off with Samantha. Did you love this movie? I loved it. You loved it? I loved it. Whoa. I also cried at the end. I was, I'm actually surprised what? that you loved it. No. I'm an original Disney kid. It, this is like got me good. Wow. You didn't think I would love it. No, I didn't. Huh. You didn't seem engaged oh, during no, the was watching process. 100% engaged. Wow. Were you taking notes? 
Yeah. Oh, because you usually never take notes, so you don't take out your phone. So when no, I saw you using I your phone, little... I assumed you were Instagramming like no, you used to. No, I was making little like plot mentions. Right, right. Just to kind of like stir my memory in the future. Like I have egg. <laughs> <laughs> and then egg in pants, question mark. <laughs> yes, egg in pants, period. <laughs> so I uh, I was taking some notes and like my notes are never good, which is why I don't usually take notes. Right. Because but you needed to remember egg and pants. Egg and pants, question mark. Um, and how do they stay warm in onesies? question mark <laughs> really it was just a lot of questions oh well maybe we'll get some answers yes please yes please so indy you saw this movie for the first time in 1993 yes and you got it a couple christmases later yeah do you still love this movie so in this podcast i tend to bring like i love my kurosawa and my scorsese and I was a little worried because I haven't been doing the real nostalgia picks very uh-huh. often. But I think this movie's better than all of those. <laughs> I fucking love this movie. Oh, he fucking loves it. It's so and good. We have profanity in front of love. I, I love Cool Runnings. It was delightful. It really was. This was the feel-good movie. And I remember that, like, Olympics just makes me cry. Yeah. Like, like, I will just cry freely for three weeks while the olympics are on two weeks three weeks something like that the month a year i don't know but like i just i cry i will be in a bar watching the gold medal game and like just weeping yeah over beer <laughs> i i get it i get it like and olympics you cried in me... this at the end at the end yeah okay yeah I may have cried like three times. <laughs> <laughs> I may have gotten close to tears a few times, but that ending sequence yeah. and then they the carry the, they carry the thing like they carry their sled over the finish line, and I was just like I was a mess. Yeah, I I get it. Well, um, <laughs> let's get into it. Maybe we'll start off with I'll talk a little bit about the real life story and the making of. I don't think that really matters because this is a movie. If it is a work of fiction, mm-hmm. but we'll mention a little bit of that stuff. And then we can just go through this movie and talk about why it is the best. <laughs> Excellent. I'm very excited. I think this is going to be good. And I hope, hopefully can answer some of the questions that you have because I have seen this movie quite a few times. <laughs> Egg and pants? Question mark? <laughs> it's so rewatchable. Oh. I could rewatch it right now and I'd be happy about that. <laughs> So, uh, like I said, it was based on a true story about the Jamaican bobsled team who went to the Olympics in 88. And people might say, like, hey, he was just trying to get in the Summer Olympics. How did he get in the Winter Olympics? They used to be in the same year. They didn't mm-hmm. separate until 92. I think 92 was the last time. They okay, were the same yeah, year. yeah. And then they did the winter again in 94. Too. So they didn't wait six years. They just did the winter twice in two years. Okay, yeah. Oh, that would have been great as an elite athlete because you don't have to wait four years and stay in shape and do your like training and get ready for the Olympics. You like cut that time in half. Yeah. So the team did compete in the four man bobsled and has gone back in many years since. I believe they went back the next year in the four man and the two, but they've gone a few times since and there is still an Olympic bobsledding program in jamaica the real driver whose name this is all off the top of my head (laughs) i believe is dudley stokes okay and he is now the president of that organization the jamaican bobsled organization whatever they're called wow uh how it came about was not quite like this they weren't failed sprinters rather they were um uh, military men and their coach was saying like no you should do this this is a good idea and they did in fact have an american coach who believed sprinters could be good bobsled pushers uh-huh. which is very true yeah and um, many sprinters and uh, speed skaters things like that have transitioned over to the bobsled i know for the canadian team not too long ago we had one of our um the running back for the Hamilton Tiger Cats really went and became a bobsledder. Yeah, That's Lumsden amazing. did that. It's probably easier on the body. Than football? Oh yeah. 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 Until like you crash. than most sports until yes. you crash. Yes, yeah. but like it doesn't involve quite as much physical 
decimation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess <laughs> as a lot of Olympic sports similar do. to to running to yeah, sprinters. Exactly. So they're kind of built for that, like track and field and anything like that. It's a, it's really hard on the joints and everything. So you have that little bit of running at the front, and then you get to sit in a sleigh. Yeah. Two of the guys really don't do a whole lot. Yeah. They're mostly working on leaning. Yeah. But the driver does most of it, and and the brakeman, I guess, does some. Yeah, I guess. So that part is real, that this team did exist. That's about it. The crash that they show in this is the actual crash from the Olympics. Right. That really happened. I believe it wasn't on their last run. It was on their second to last run. Mm. Uh, they weren't really like ahead of the pace when they crashed. Right. And they did finish, I think, third last overall. It's like loosely pace. Yeah. Yeah. All of those things happen in the movie. The timing, of course, is different. Uh, one thing that is quite true, when they crashed, they stayed in... They were like, oh, shook up, of course. I remember mm -hmm. one of the... I can't remember who it was, but one of the Bob Sledders said, because he was one of the middle guys, didn't realize that they had crashed until he smelled the burning from his helmet oh because of God. all the friction. <laughs> Because you when you're in the middle, down, you're so down. And you're like... And there's like a lot of G-force all right? the time. So And you're going up the sidewall. Yeah, and he's so also not the most experienced down, guy. So if you're upside down, like, yeah. you're not gonna know. <laughs> yeah, and their lack of experience was also uh, true to life. Mm. And at the end, when they crashed, they did receive an actual slow clap. And the claps built. And although they did not pick up and carry their sled because it's like 600 pounds and they're on ice and uh, that's yeah. a bad idea. They did push it to the finish oh. line and um, one, I'm gonna of, cry like right now. one of the members <laughs> did say that he had felt like a failure when they crashed, but by the time they got to the finish line with the applause and carry, um, pushing the sled, that he did not feel like a failure and they felt that they had accomplished something. Oh, that's nice. So the spirit of it... I know a lot of people just go like, well, this part's not true. This part's not true. No, but There's not no the one point. named Sanka Coffee, <laughs> which is true, uh, <laughs> which um, is not true that there is no one named that, of course. But I feel like the heart of the story is there. Yeah. And a lot of the specifics are there as well. As for the making of this movie, it went through a lot of different iterations. The first draft was a very serious story, and it was more about people who desperately wanted to leave the island and get out of the, the life that they had there, mm -hmm. and it was much more serious. That switched in many drafts. The one that we see was actually written by this guy on a heroin binge. Like, he was real fucked up and uh, wrote Cool Runnings. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Lots of people were approached, like Denzel Washington and Eddie Murphy. They mm -hmm. turned it down. It wasn't enough money because it's not a huge budget. Mm -hmm. John Candy got a hold of the script and agreed to take much less money to do it. And he himself championed it. It was going to be a straight to video, much lower budget. But he was like, no, we have something. Yeah. Here. This is something very special. And took the script around to people himself trying to get it made. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, Tupac Shakur auditioned to be in it. Really? Eric LaSalle, Cuba Gooden Jr., but, of course, we got the four guys that we got. I think it's better that they're not, like... Yeah, I liked it that they were... Like, kind of not... Their names not to nobodies, me. Not nobodies, but... But... At the time, pretty much. Yeah. Malik Yoba hadn't been in anything. Leon didn't really do much until the mm -hmm. years following. Uh, Raul Lewis, I believe, is Junior mm -hmm. Bevan's name. And he was a script guy. He oh. wasn't there. He He's a Trinidadian. Trinidadian? Trinidadian. Yeah, Trinidadian. And he was there to coach with accents. Oh. Then he read and they're like, yeah, that works. And they put him in. And I, I feel that. like his inexperience works because yes. of who his character is. Yeah. He's kind of a shy, meek guy, so that works. Yeah. Uh, Dougie Doug was kind of a up-and-coming stand-up comedian. Mm. And that was pretty much all that he was known for. So yeah. John Candy was the big name. Right. It would have been weird to see, like, Cuba Gooding Jr. Of course, he wasn't much at the time Tupac either. Tupac or, like, yeah. any of those guys. Like, I like that these aren't guys that you, like, instantly know. Yeah. And Malik Yoba, I think this was his first, like, real studio movie. And I, then after this, he went on and did uh, New York Undercover, which I loved. And I think he was in a show that you like because he was in Designated Survivor. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
New York Undercover, also great soundtrack for any of you who are into mid nineties hip hop. He's got quite the he's got quite the acting resume now. He's yeah, in, started with cool he's Runners. in Empire, which is like a big, big show. show. He was in Designated Survivor. Yeah, wow. He's but done quite a But the most bit. important thing he's done, of course, cool running. was writing the theme. Yes, Malik Yoba did I that. I read about that, that oh, he wrote really? it for his audition. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so cool. Yeah. I don't look anything up beforehand, even if I know what movie we're doing. I don't look a whole bunch up, but I just saw that on the Wikipedia page. And I read one? a little bit about it. As you can see on my notes, I just say making of. This is all off the top of my head because I know this movie so well. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> um, one thing about their accents, they're not great, but it was a source of a lot of controversy in a few different ways. So the making of this movie kind of mirrored the movie itself in some unintended ways, as is the case when you have black people coming into a white world, whether mm. it is filmmaking or bobsledding. Mm. So the Disney people, apparently they spent time doing like proper accents. Right. Disney people did not like it. They're like, no one's going to understand what you're saying. Right. So yeah. they brought in um, some people to teach them a different accent and they went with Trinidadian instead because Sebastian the Crab has more of a Trinidad accent right. and they wanted them to sound that, like Sebastian. Oh my God. So, so that's, that's what um, Raul D. Lewis was doing there? I think so. But he like actually is from Trinidad hmm. and Dougie Doug's dad is Jamaican. And I think one of Leon's parents is Jamaican as well. So they were working on them properly, but then were told not to do that and do this other thing instead. But what you hmm, get at sketchy. least isn't... <laughs> Like super caricature Yeah. It's light. It's not a Jamaican accent. No. But it is a Caribbean accent, I guess. And some people have it stronger than others. But at least it's not cartoonish and over the top. True. So I would rather they would go with just not an incorrect accent <laughs> yeah. than a stereotypical one. True. So that's true. How... It's over the top. And I mean, it's like I'm not trying to give the Disney Corporation, which is problematic in itself, um, any like leeway. But like it's for kids. It's for the greater audience. And it's not really about the accents. It's more about the story. So I, I'm going to let it slide. <laughs> And there was also a scene where they were going to build a snowman and then they give the snowman a joint because like, Jamaica, weed, hilarious. <laughs> uh, the four of them refused. Oh, good for them. Yeah. Good for them. And for like young actors that are unproven in a Disney movie, that yeah. takes a lot of guts. No kidding. And Turtle Top was very angry about it, but it's not in the movie and that is for the best. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I think that is too far. Since we're not going with real accents, I don't think stereotypical stuff is good. Yeah, and um, I don't have any like big soliloquies planned for today. I don't oh, really? get into the themes oh. nearly as much. All my notes are, I just wrote lines from the movie in order. That's it. <laughs> but I feel like they're going to come out and... One of those things we would probably talk about is race. And I think we'll probably get into that stuff yeah. in this and how it's portrayed. Oh, absolutely. And how or not problematic it is. But um, you know what my father, grandfather says? What? Get back to work. <laughs> so let's get into it. Perfect. I love all the things that Senka yells yes. throughout. Uh, so much of it is 80 yard and they're all funny to me. Yeah, they're good lines. He has a lot of really good one-liners. So we're introduced to Doris at the beginning, and he's going for a run. And is he married? Is that his girlfriend? We don't know. <laughs> we also kind of find out he's a teacher. Does that matter? Not really. Yeah, it's just like there's no backstory for him. It doesn't matter. Well, the backstory we do get is that his father is an Olympic gold medalist. Yes. And he, whether or not it comes out explicitly, feels a lot of pressure to follow in his father's footsteps. Mm -hmm. And he believes following in his father's footsteps means winning an Olympic gold medal. Yes. But he learns that it means so much more than that. Excuse me while I cry. I'm just going to cry this whole episode, okay? Okay. That'll be fun to edit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
We also get introduced by, to Sanka Kathi. Mm-hmm. That's one thing I maybe have issue with. The character names of Sanka Kathi and Yul Brenner. Do you know who Yul Brenner is? No, I don't. He's a um, big actor from uh, 60s-ish. He was in like King and I and big epic stuff. Right. And it's a very uh, notable name. Yeah. That is not a name a lot of people have. So to name this character that, why? It does not add anything. And same with Sanka Coffee. We get that his character is a joke, but his name doesn't need to be a joke. No. Those are the only things. Those are, that's maybe my only issue with this whole movie. <laughs> and this story, this movie, has a very formulaic plot. A plot that you've seen many times if you've seen sports movies, right? Mm-hmm. There's not a lot new here. Like, you have the underdogs. They're coached by a washed-up has-been who has some sort of scandal in his past. Yes. That could be half of the, the sports movies out there. Mm-hmm. That's Hoosiers. That's Mighty Ducks. It's a training montage. Yeah. This gets two training montages. I know. I which love a good great. training montage. And uh, yeah, when they're at their lowest, the team gets, they rally together and they say, we're not going to give up and they become better. But this includes something that those don't. And that's failure. Mm. Like the first time we really get to see our our heroic lead he is in the dust, losing the race. Yes. And that shot always gets me when he's on the ground and he has the um, the clay on his face and he's looking up and you can just see the people celebrating way off in the distance. Yeah. Beautiful shot. Mm-hmm. I love it. Very effective. And it is very different than what we would see in most movies because it's not a joke. Usually in a movie with the lightheartedness that this has for the most part... Something like that would be played as comedic, but here it is is very tragic. And it's not the only case of that. Like later on we get, we're kind of, I'm jumping ahead, but I now, you know how I said I have no soliloquies? I've kind of found one. <laughs> <laughs> but later on in the movie, we get the bit where Malik Yoba's Yul Brenner says, I'm going to live right down there. And he has a picture of Buckingham Palace. Yeah. And that should be played as a joke in most movies like this. But it's played dead serious. And you get to see a man's dreams dying in front of him. A grown man who was like this tough, like badass character this whole movie. Yeah, that was hard to watch. Absolutely. And then we get Junior Bevel coming up to him and doing that speech about how like, The more people we have in the world, the better the world will be, especially for people like us. Mm -hmm. You go get your palace. And that was like, I know it's a little manipulative and a little on the nose, but it's brilliant and it worked. Yes. And that's what this movie does a lot of. It says like, you know what? You're not going to win all the time. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get everything you want. Wanting it more will not get you everything. Right. Which is the opposite of what most sports movies tell you. But it says, but you can get what you need. You know, you might not want to always get what you want. <laughs> but you'll get what you need. But if you try sometime, you, you just might find. You, you get what you need. Thank and you for that, that. Is, that is the, the mesh message yeah. of this movie. Because he knows, and we all know, he's not going to live in Buckingham Palace. But we believe that a man like this, who is driven, Mm -hmm. will find success. Yeah. And having Junior, who's been his kind of um, enemy for much of this movie, Mm -hmm. sit him down and like prop him up like that. Be like, hey. Yeah. We're going to do this. (laughs) I liked that. There there were some really touching moments in the movies. Like when Yul Brynner comes over and is like, "Uh, we're not... Like, we may be on the same team, but we're not teammates. But I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and I was like, yeah, I, like, from coaching, I, like, I know those kids who then you, you get them to a certain point and then all of a sudden they're, like, best friends with everybody. So it just, it rang true in a lot of ways. Yeah, the teamwork part of this, I think, is just as effective as, as a lot of those sports movies where it's all these different people. How will they ever work together? Here, they're not all so different. 
They're mm-hmm. not going out of their way to be like, these people would never be together if it yeah. weren't for this. But they do each have very distinct motivations, mm-hmm. believable grounded motivations, and they're all kind of um, experts in their own way, which is not something we often see. Like mm-hmm. we often see people who are the outcasts. Yes. And in this movie, they're playing it both ways, which I think is is pretty effective yeah because they're all three of them are olympic level sprinters yes to begin with they're winners yeah and uh sanka is in his own mind at least the greatest pushcart champion in all of (laughs) jamaica yeah in a lot of like sports movies like this you got like the four misfits from the team that aren't good and suddenly they become like olympic level athletes with some training montages one good training montage and you're an olympic athlete true so took two for them so it's a little more realistic exactly so it it was nice like i it's it's interesting to see that they are like olympic level athletes already because Mm. they're they're in the olympic trials they're they're competing in their sport trying to be the best and trying to go to the olympics and it's interesting to see them fail at that and then come back and find a new way to go to the olympics yeah because here I think it's an even better and more well-rounded story than just having someone coming from nothing and achieving greatness. Yeah. They had greatness, were humbled, had to start over again, Mm -hmm. and then had to get there again. Yes. Which is kind of like what I was saying earlier about the failures in this movie. It makes it a little more real world, Mm -hmm. even though it is this big feel-good story. Yes. And they kind of achieved that greatness together. They had uh, only failed separately and then they achieve it. And of course, it's not what you would normally achieve because even when we were talking last week, you're like, oh yeah, they're going to win though. And then they don't. Yeah. But they win. They win. But they don't. In a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that like as a coach, you talk to your athletes about like, you know what? You have to figure out what your winning is and it's not always the trophy. There you go. Sometimes it's hitting your routine perfectly and you just don't have the points and you don't win, but you did the best you could. There's my coach moment for the. <laughs> and that's kind of echoed right after the race when he goes and says like, oh, we have to do a re-race. Mm-hmm. It wasn't fair. And the head of the organization says, it rarely is, my boy. It rarely uh, is. Yes. And another like hard lesson in this kid's movie. Yeah. Because you just kind of have to, you know what? Things aren't going to be fair. No. And you better you better live with that. Yeah. And this movie has a surprisingly dark overall message about, yeah, things aren't going to work out for you. Yeah. But it's delivered in this package of this uplifting sports movie that mm-hmm. you're fine with that. Yeah. You're happy. You're thrilled with that. Yeah. And I love the message of like winning isn't everything and what's your like goal what's your win yeah and i love that that's so good so then doris wants to go and he learns about irving blitzer who was the coach who wanted to make his dad a bobsled driver Mm -hmm. and he says well this is my ticket i'm gonna go to the olympics because he's very he has his blinders on he wants that olympic gold medal and that's it so he sees that this is his going to be his way there and I like the way he gets Sanka in because Sanka doesn't need to prove anything. No. He's actually kind of, although just like the comedic, comedic relief and the gesture character, mm-hmm. he's the most fully actualized person at the beginning. Oh, for sure. Sanka knows who he is. Yeah, he's He doesn't he's need to prove anything to anyone. Yeah, he's happy. He's good. And I love how Doris gets him on the team. Do you remember the line? No. So all you have to do is say... Sanka, you're my best friend. Oh, yeah. We've been through a whole heap together, and I really, really need you. <laughs> and then, of course, Dury says, and we've been through a whole lot together. He's, heap! Heap! <laughs> Sorry, man. Whole heap together. <laughs> and I really, really need you. Aww. And that's that's all. That's Sanka's reasoning. And you know what? That's enough. I He's helping his best friend. loved their friendship. They're funny. They're funny. It's such a, like classic friendship where you have all those like little weird things that like to the outside world seem like strange yeah and then to, but you like, can tell they to have you a guys like to you and your best friend it's totally normal mm-hmm. yeah and i feel like anybody who's ever had a best friend 
will understand that there's like the little weird things that you do. And I liked that when it becomes the four of them, it's not Doris and Sanka together versus the other people. Mm -hmm. Their friendship is strong enough that they don't need to like talk about it or show it. Yeah. They're just like, yeah, of course he's my best friend. Yeah, we're best friends. That's why I'm here. Whatever. So then they get uh, Blitzer on board and they have that sequence where they show the videos, the bobsled videos. Uh-huh. And that's just like a, a quality visual gag. That yeah. They show it all and then they turn on the lights and everyone's gone. Yeah. I like that. That Good was stuff. funny. Nobody wants to do that. I also love that the video was people like crashing and burning yeah. in a bobsled. And then the ha- the headline of man dies in bobsled yeah. accident. <laughs> And we get reintroduced to Junior and Yule, and uh, Yule chases him around, and he says something about beating his butt, or how about I kick your butt, and then he says, how about I draw a line down the middle of your head so it looks like a butt, (laughs) which, quality sank of material. Love a good butt joke. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you get a few of them in this Yes, it's true. And I like that it's established early that they all have a good reason to go. And at this point, we think we know what they all are. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, Sanka's helping his friend, Doris wants a medal, Yul Brenner wants to get off the island, and Junior, at this point, is just saying, like, well, I want to help you because it's because of me that you lost. Yeah. Which is a great reason, but then all of these kind of get elaborated on later and change. True. And you kind of see the growth and the acceptance throughout the movie, which I love. Yeah. Like, they at the beginning, they're very closed and they're doing it for themselves and if this were your average feel-good movie Mm -hmm. you wouldn't need that change no and it would be a fun movie without it oh for sure but that's what makes it like that's that's why i love it that's why it's great sports gold (laughs) and we get the bit about how dury should be the driver even though sanka is a push cart driver and the line about do you dig where i'm coming from that whole bit i say that Quite often, if I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's like, and we get our first training montage, which is a lot of fun. Montage, montage, montage. With them going down the hill and their kind of football equipment yeah. and the modified push cart or yes. whatever it is. With the wheels on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, love the idea that they trained in Jamaica for... A snow and ice event. That is true. And that is still true. Never having seen snow before. Yeah. That is... It's amazing. Amazing to me. And I love that. And that is such a like testament to Olympic athletes. Because you can't always be on the correct course. That would be right. prohibitively expensive in a lot of sports. And so you have to do with... Like you have to do the best you can with what you have. And sometimes that is sand and a hill in Jamaica. <laughs> yeah. And eventually they get their five nines. So we see that they're growing and getting better and they're trying to raise money, which was fun, of course. Yeah. And when they go to ask people for sponsorship, they all have the same desk and it's clearly the same yeah. office with yeah. just like a different plant yeah. in it. But whatever. Different it's a little configuration of office. Yeah. <laughs> the kissing booth. That was a fun one. Mm-hmm. When Teresa's girlfriend or wife or whoever Whoever, comes yeah. What was your favorite way to raise money? Um, I think the kissing booth was my favorite. And then... Singing on the street? Uh, yeah. And Do you when... remember how the song goes? No. I bet you're going to sing it for me, though. Oh, I was hoping you'd ask, how did it go? And how did like, it go? How did it go? It went like this. <laughs> I like that joke, too. Like, So how did your singing go? How did it go? How did it go? It went like this. Not people say you know they can't believe it. <laughs> Sanka, just, just funny. It's so good. And they get the money from Junior because he sells his car. Yeah. That was nice. Because I he liked wants that. you to have it. You mean us. Yeah. No, I like that. And I liked I liked Junior because he's clearly been very sheltered with his like with his parents and his like they're the rich ones on the island, right? Mm-hmm. So they clearly he didn't mix a lot with the other people on the island. Yeah. And so it was really nice to see him kind of come out of his shell. Yes, yeah. And I think that 
this whole experience for him was like life changing, and I love that because yeah, and we'll that's get what you need in a sports movie. Absolutely, we'll get into that later. But you can tell because at this point, it seems like the only reason he is going mm-hmm. is because he feels guilt for costing Darius his chance. Right. But then we learn it is more than that. Yeah, and I love when he stands up to his dad. Yeah. Because that's another thing that you get in sports movies. Standing up to your dad? Yeah. Oh. Okay, maybe like dance or cheerleading movies I'm thinking of. Sure. But there's always that dad who doesn't know that's true, what their son is doing or daughter is doing and has this other grand plan for them. And then they find out because like you can't travel to a foreign country. No, dad, I want to dance. Exactly. I'm not going to be an accountant like you. Yes. That is true. That happens yeah. a lot. No, and I feel like maybe it's just Or like acting my movies or yeah. if they're a stand-up comedian or an artist or a musician. I want you it's to be a doctor, yeah. son, so that you never have to want for anything like I did. And like I love when Junior says, didn't you work as hard as you did so your children would have an easier life? This is this is my life. Like I love that mm. idea of like this is what I'm choosing to do with my life because you worked really hard for me so that I could choose what I wanted to do with my yeah. life. And then that's always such a catch twenty two. <laughs> then they go to Calgary. Yay, Calgary. <laughs> and for people out there who aren't familiar, that scene when they open the door and it's that blizzard yeah yeah that's how it looks that's that is true not literally... all the time but that is how our life personally has been for the last month or so it's actually been much colder than that it has been rough here but it's been 30 below the at ice 35. crystals and just that like wind hitting you as you exit a building and not being able to breathe in that is 100 percent true <laughs> So people who may not be familiar, when you have big blowing snow like in that, you think that's the coldest, that's actually better. Because if there's snowflakes in the air, it has to be uh, warm enough for snow. It can be too cold for snow, at which point the moisture in the air freezes and there's just hanging ice in the air. Ice crystals. And of course, to us, we're like, yeah, of course, I see that yeah, all the time. Yeah, it happens, but like... I think a lot of our listeners would be like, wait, what? The <laughs> yeah. air freezes? Yeah. yeah, the air freezes. It gets too cold for snow here. Yeah. And we are three hours, two and a half hours north of Calgary. Yes. Um, so we actually get colder than Calgary most winters. Yeah. And we've been in kind of a polar vortex this last month. So the entire province has been very cold. But usually, Calgary is. 10 degrees at least warmer than Edmonton. Something like that. But yeah, it gets so cold that it cannot physically snow. Yeah. Which is crazy. And I like, like, when I think about it that way, I'm like, why do we live here? This is. I ask myself. This is terrible. (laughs) And this cold weather leads to a great sight gag where Sanka goes and puts on all of the clothing he owns, including the bag, which is just good physical comedy. Um, and some of the clothing that these guys wear is, like, popular now. Yeah, it's weird that we're old enough that things from our childhood have yeah. come back. And I didn't get it when my parents would say, like, oh, yeah, we wrote wore that as a kid. And I was like, no, you didn't. <laughs> you we're that. original. Wow, it's weird to see it's people weird. wearing, like, the shitty 90s clothes There now. were some, like, purple tracksuits happening in that. I had a stretch in elementary where i wore purple tracksuits as a dance kid oh we all did and like i, I purple remember, teal yeah were like the two purple and teal yeah. yeah and like white and they were various tracksuit patterns and oh my god yeah it was like the coolest thing you could have and then i had one of those now like junior wears a like alpine kind of printed fleece and i said to you i'm like i want that sweater now like i would be very cool if i own that now and like north face makes similar fleeces and i'm not sure what brand he was wearing but like they are like 200 dollars. like they are expensive and i'm like man some thrift store has that fleece in it and i wish i could find it (laughs) (laughs) good some good uh good outfits some, some awesome outfits so then they go to the bobsled hill for the first time, and we have the classic moment where it's silence as everyone turns and looks at mm-hmm. them. And Yul Brenner says, like, we're different. People are always afraid of what's different. 
the entering the like arena or competition space or whatever that whole feeling of everyone going silent is such a like relatable thing yeah like i just i feel that and you know as like someone who's competed it's like oh like you get like a chill wait where would you get that oh at cheer why um in like edmonton if you go to provincials or like cities like teams like everyone knows the teams and there's like sometimes you know like an expectation and you feel that and people stop and look at you oh i don't think that's what's going on here no no they're not like in awe of the jamaicans they're like hey look black people oh okay because i know what this feels like <laughs> <I'm> sorry <laughs> and i think it, i think that's more because like Yul brenner says we're different people yeah. are always afraid of what's different true and i like even when i saw this when i was like eight or whatever was yeah, the only non-white person on my hockey team. I was the only non-white person at my school. And no, I, you know what? There was one black kid and one Chinese kid. I exaggerate. Oh, whoa. <laughs> in, in, in the school. On the Diversity. hockey team. It's like in my league, probably. I was wow. always like the only not white person. Huh. And this movie, now that I like really think about it, that line of like people are always afraid of what's different and how they're treated that's how like my first understanding of what racism was like i was mm -hmm. always like told to go to countries that i'm not from and like when you're six you don't really get it yeah it was like i'm not from there what yeah. are you guys talking about yeah. and like people say things about the color of your skin a lot but this movie because i guess we'll get into it eventually mm -hmm. but it doesn't outright say that this is racism mm -hmm. but it is a kid's movie so you could make the argument that, like, I'm not going to make an argument and say, like, oh, kids aren't ready to hear about it. Because no. if you're ready to experience it, you're ready to learn about yeah. it. Yeah, we should be teaching kids about racism their entire life. <laughs> but I'm not going to make the argument that this should be more direct for kids to understand. Uh -huh. I saw it as a kid who was experiencing racism, and I got it. Mm -hmm. And it did it in a way for me to understand. Right. And I think because it's not specifically american because american racism is usually what we see and that's very right. systemic in a uniquely american way right this is much simpler and as someone who's like traveled a lot in europe and stuff the racism there often is as simple as like you're a different color i don't like it mm -hmm. it doesn't have the same baggage as it does in the united states and right. canada because there is a, a very different history mm -hmm. so the simplistic way that they put it because it is very just like you're different mm -hmm. and it can be that simple and as a kid it pretty much was that simple right. and this movie taught me about it huh. this movie like I think might get criticism now for tiptoeing around. It. Right. But it does but it's it a in a way movie. for children. Yeah. And like, it's a good way to introduce you to it. Absolutely. And it's a good way for parents to introduce children to it. Yes. Yeah. And that theme like goes on throughout the movie. And I think the only time it's really said outright is when... Uh, Irv, John Candy's character, said uh, when they were talking about the team being an embarrassment, mm -hmm. he says, oh, I didn't realize four men and four black men in a sled could make you blush. <laughs> and that's when the president goes, whoa, 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 that's not what we're saying here. <laughs> right. But clearly that is the subtext. Yeah. And they only make it explicit here and there. But if you are someone who's like gone through it, it's explicit. You know exactly what's going on. And I think to kids, it's explicit enough to teach you like, oh, what's happening there is wrong. Mm -hmm. They don't break it down of why it's wrong or the history behind it. Mm -hmm. You just see what's happening and you see it's wrong. Right. And I think that's a great way to teach kids. Oh, for sure. And like that's the kind of racism that really needs to be like dealt with and pointed out is that subtle behind the scenes throwaway comment kind of racism right you don't have to be brave to say like oh the kkk is bad yeah but to call people out on little things yeah that's what people need to do yeah because that's not all the majority racism of is white hoods and burning cross like burning people yeah it's it's little throwaway comments and like micro things that happen that just keep going yeah and this it's explicit enough it's not like little subtle no, things no, no. but but like those are the kinds of things that people need to call out and then after this we get that buckingham palace 
part that we already talked mm-hmm. about. And I love it because it is Junior that comes to Yul Brenner's rescue. No, rescue is probably too much, but he's on his side. Yeah. And that's nice because you get to see that friendship between them forming and it's going to like really take off mm-hmm. after this. Sanka was a bit of a jerk in that scene though, but yeah. I guess he's he's wisecracking. That's what he does. And... He's just like, yeah, he's comedic, comedic timing for yeah. the team. <laughs> Yeah, because he starts laughing when he sees the Buckingham Palace. But then also, I kind of get it. Yeah. Like, if there was a guy who was kind of bullying me and then said, I'm going to live in Buckingham Palace, I'd be like, no, you're not, you dummy. Yeah. And Doris stays home when they all go out to party. And that's a fun scene because first we get to see Sanga line dancing. Mm -hmm. And I like that he switches hats with that lady. Yeah, (laughs) that was cute. (laughs) That made me think of, like, I've gone to rodeos as an adult yes. in small town Alberta. That's where I get, like, the silence and everyone turns and stares. Ooh. And you're just like, ooh. Hey. But I liked uh, Sanka line dancing. That was a lot I'm of pretty sure that bar is still in Calgary. I can't remember I what it's ask. called. All you Calgarians, let us know. Yeah. And we get uh, Josef Gruhl, the East German kind of bullying junior. And that's when we get the big speech with Yul Brenner. Pumping up uh, Junior with the icy pride, icy power. Yeah. Which is, again, a great, a great message. Because this team in this movie could easily have been like, hey, look at these Jamaicans. They can't do anything right. That could have been a movie very easily. Mm -hmm. And you get that a little bit with Sanka because he is like, he's a joke. He's a jester character. Mm -hmm. But I never feel that the movie is laughing at them. Mm Mm-hmm. Because like, oh, they he can't go out in the cold. Yeah, I get it. It's freezing. It's Nobody awful. can. That Nobody makes wants sense that. To me. Oh, they can't bobsled well. Yeah, they just learned. They're becoming masters before our eyes. Yeah. I never feel the movie makes the joke at the expense of them, which I think a lot of lesser movies would do. And that's only more solidified in this speech because it is about their their pride and their power. Yeah. And we get that more towards the end because Doris has the bit about not being as confident in who he is. Mm-hmm. And all of these people, one after another, are gaining confidence yeah. in themselves. Like Yul Brenner finds out he's not going to live in Buckingham Palace, but then he gets the, the pep talk about, but you are great and mm-hmm. you will do something great. Not that but something. Yeah. And here, Junior, who's... That's not your thing, but there is something here for you. <laughs> yeah. And then in the speech that Yul Brenner gives to Junior, he's felt that he's not enough. Mm-hmm. And at this point, we just think it's because he's fallen in the race, and then this East German guy is, like, picking on him. Right. But later on, we find out that he's just living in his father's shadow and is just doing anything he can to get out from under it. Right. And Yul Brenner's speech is the thing that... Mm -hmm. Gives him that pride and that power in who he is and knowing that who he is is enough and who he is is not, maybe not a sprinter, maybe not a bobsledder, but Mm -hmm. it's not his father and he is enough as he is. Yes. And that's a great message. I love that. That was so good. Those are such like big moments in this movie. Mm -hmm. And it has several of them and they all work for me. Mm Mm-hmm. I think there's something about sports movies because they don't have to rely on metaphor as much because sports themselves are the metaphor for your life. Yeah. You don't have to have a roundabout metaphor because the sport is the thing. Mm -hmm. You have to overcome all of that adversity to become what you want. But this movie does take it further. Mm -hmm. And most sports movies don't. And that the sport was the metaphor for all of their struggles yeah. and we get to see that mirroring and, I and think changing their life yeah. yeah so then they get in the big fight and they go home and um Doris is very angry at them john candy is angry at them and that's when we get the kind of the they've at they're at the bottom again and then we have to have our second training montage yes. for them to uh to get together as a team because they were learning something new but now they're really coming together yes. and They've gained all of these individual strengths, mm-hmm. but Doris hasn't yet. Yes. I think that comes later. Yes. But that training montage was very fun as well. I think that's the one to rise above it. Yeah. You've got to rise above it. That was fun. 
Um, one of my favorite lines from the movie was, we can't bobsled Swiss, we have to bobsled Jamaican. <laughs> oh, that comes later. Oh, is that later? Yeah. Okay. Because here we have the um, the qualification stuff first. Right. And they have to do their qualifying run, and they do qualify. But then the committee changes the rules, and John Candy has uh, his chance to make this big speech. Mm-hmm. And that's the one about the... Uh, Sorry, I didn't realize that four black men in a sled could make you blush. <laughs> and he has this big speech about, like, yes, years ago, I forgot what the Olympics were all about. Yeah. But take it out on me. Don't take it out on my guys. Mm-hmm. And that speech, I thought, was pretty great as no, well. Yeah, it was such a good speech. They're all, I don't know. Some good speeches. Yeah. Some well, good I montages. And John Candy, like, this movie is, uh, it's a little sad to watch because mm-hmm. this was the last one he did in his lifetime. Well, he, two more came out, but he got to see this one come out. Right. And I just wish we had gotten more of him mm-hmm. because guys who are similar, like maybe that are silly so much of the time, right. like your Adam Sandler's got a chance to do Punch Drunk Love. Like right. They got a chance to do those dramatic turns. And John Candy never really got that ability. We get to see it a little in this one because... For the most part in his career, he's the silliest one. Mm -hmm. And he's not in this. He plays it more straight than everyone outside of maybe Nick Doris. Mm -hmm. And to see his dramatic acting abilities, I just wish that, you know, we could have gotten more Mm -hmm. more of him. We could have seen an older John Candy in stuff. Oh, for sure. But... We don't, and that's that's sad. But we get this, this and is that his speech legacy. is. <laughs> I think that speech is great. Oh, for sure, that was such a beautiful speech, and it had so much emotion behind it. And I think that that is such a good legacy for him. Yeah, it's weird though because at this point he was kind of getting into kids' movies, and I'm not sure if that was by choice or just what happened. Was available, yeah, yeah. So I learned about him at this time because this came out and i think uncle uncle buck came out when i was like six or something so that's what i knew him as it right. wasn't until later that i got to go back as an adult and see what he had done earlier than that mm. when he wasn't just in kids movies oh right. and home alone of course home alone yes yeah home alone as well he just really wanted to be in it so i think they paid him 400 bucks 400 john candy the guy who delivers the pizza in home alone made more than john candy did in that because john candy was just like yeah i just want to be a part I of it. Be in it yeah well he was rich at this point he's he's well off enough yeah. but everyone else is making more than him that's amazing same in this he took a pay cut to be in this because he was just a oh, big fan of it what a guy yeah what a guy <laughs> I think it was around here when Doris sees the Swiss team Mm -hmm. and he's in awe of them. And that's a beautifully shot scene where it's dark out and we get the twinkling lights of Calgary way Mm -hmm. off in the distance. And he sees them going in slow motion and they're slapping the helmets and the the Eins, Weins, Times and and how good they are. And to him at this point, it's just skill and excellence. That's Mm -hmm. what he wants. Yeah. And so he sees them doing that. And then, of course, in their first run, he mimics all of those things. Yes, yeah. And tries to be be like the Swiss. You don't see the Swiss team carrying on like that. So, yes, <laughs> but you never see the Swiss team with a pretty girl either. True. <laughs> <laughs> or having fun either. If they ever saw a pretty girl, they'd probably say, Eins, Feins, trying to try to push her down some ice. <laughs> <laughs> that was a cute little sequence. Yeah. And then after their... Uh, unfortunate first run is that's when we get that speech that you were talking about mm-hmm. which was very good as well yeah where we get to see sanka be serious yeah. for the first time and it's a nice little role reversal yeah because he says like i didn't come here to forget where i came from and Doris says like well i'm just trying to be the best i can be and he says the best i can be is jamaican if we look jamaican walk jamaican talk jamaican and is jamaican we better sure as hell bobsled jamaican <laughs> which is Great, and I love it. It's kind of sad that they're not, like, Jamaican, Mm -hmm. like the actors. That would have been cool if they got Jamaican actors with proper Jamaican accents. But the sentiment is still there, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to forgive the inauthenticity of certain things because the spirit is there. And I, uh, yeah, I kind of love it. And this is the beginning of the turning point for Doris, I guess, because his turn comes much later. I think John Candy's comes earlier when he, maybe it turns for him in the speech itself. But then Doris goes up to him and 
says like, I'm going to ask you something you don't have to answer if you don't want to. And of course, Blitzer knows like, you want to know why I cheated. And he says like, you had everything. You had the gold medals. And he has the speech about if you make your life, if you make winning everything, you have to keep on winning at all costs. Mm -hmm. And the really good line of when they're talking about gold medals, of if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. Right. And that's something that I think we've seen John Candy come to that conclusion throughout this movie, mm -hmm. but it's not until this point, way later in the movie, that it starts clicking for Doris. Right. And of course, he says, like, well, how will I know? When you cross that finish line, you'll know. Mm -hmm. And that's setting us up very deliberately, but still in my mind, very effectively for that finish line. Yeah, so watching that scene where they are kind of on their side and no one's moving in the sled. Oh, yeah, so this is the their final run when they final crash. Run. And that is real footage from the crash. Yeah, and no one's moving their head. And I'm like, they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> like, I miscalled this one. Oh, yeah, so how did that feel for you? Were you surprised? Because you thought they well, would probably win. I assumed that they would win just because it was like it was like a Disney movie. Yeah. And like a sports movie and usually they're winners or they learn some kind of big lesson. So the outcome was that they learned a big lesson and they weren't winners, but they did the best that they could and they came out, you know, champions in their own mind. Mm. So that wasn't like a letdown for me, but it was just kind of different from how I thought the movie would it's, go. It's shocking, though. It is shocking. Because we're not programmed for that because we've no. seen this type of movie yeah. many times and they always win, right? Exactly. So it was interesting to see that like differentiation from like a classic sports movie where mm. the underdog becomes the champion and you win. And so I, it was shocking, but at the same time, I, you feel those emotions as they're happening to the athletes. Yeah. And you really like hold your breath as they're sliding down the ice sideways and hitting their heads on on the ice and they're they're trying to get out of the sleigh and trying to like right the sleigh upright and the emergency people are running towards them and like you really feel all those moments and they did such a good job of like making it feel so real yeah and perhaps the surprise is what helps make it so much more emotional mm -hmm. and effective emotionally because you're kind of caught off guard yeah and you can't really prepare yourself because you're like oh here's where they win and now i'm gonna be all happy and i'll yeah. cry happy tears but then it twists on you yeah and you're kind of reeling and then the slow clap and um them coming out into the crowd and everything. And yeah, when the, the emergency people part and you see them carrying the sled through. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, so cliche. I forgive a good all shot. of it. No, like, and the cliche-ness, you know what? Sometimes you need that in a sports movie. When it's done well, it works. And if it works, it doesn't matter if it's cliche or not. Who cares? And at the end, when Doris hugs Irv... And he thanks him. And I love that Irv's only line is, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Because normally, like we've come across movies like this a lot. And you're like, you should, all of you diehard fans out there, be saying like, hey, a ragtag team of black people who were brought to the top by like a white leader. Nah. Indy, why aren't you going to complain about the white savior? Because... Doris saves Irv. Yes. It is not the other no, way around. No. He has the knowledge. Yeah. But they do it as a team, a foursome. Yep. And they he's... prop up each other yeah. in those speeches that we talked about. Um, even Sanka props up Doris. Yule and Junior do it both for each other. Mm -hmm. But at the end... We still have the character of Irv who has been lost. Mm -hmm. He's been like just wandering around this island for what, like 20 years yeah. now and has had no direction. It's Doris's passion, Doris's commitment to excellence. And in the end, his like willingness to, to learn. Mm -hmm. And that's what Irv has lost over all this time. And Doris gave it back to him. Doris is the one who saves yeah. Irv Blitzer. Uh, so good. And just that line of, no, thank you, that got me more than most of the things. Oh, for sure. And the scene of 
the four of them carrying this sled across to finish, I think it's like 24th out of 26 or something mm-hmm. like that. That goes back into those themes of failure that we had throughout the movie. And here they're acknowledging this loss, but it it's like the ultimate cap on all of those little bits that they were placing throughout the movie that they have failed. Yeah. And yes, you child watching this movie, you will fail. Mm-hmm. You're probably never going to the Olympics. You're probably <laughs> never winning. But if you look for those little internal victories, yeah. you will win. Exactly. And because, like Irv said, you will know once you cross that finish line, they've lost. But there's no doubt in anyone's mind when Doris walks across that he feels like a winner mm-hmm. and he finally gets it. Yeah. It's not until the very end. Like all of the other characters have had their turn already. But Doris doesn't really get it until he walks to the end. Yeah. And he, we can just feel he's yeah. victorious. Exactly. And that's such an important thing to learn as like an athlete or as a coach or just as a human being is like you have to find your wins in places other than like medals. Yeah. Or placing high or, you know, being the best. Sometimes there are wins other than that. And those are the kinds of things that you have to like grab onto to have a nice life well i don't know what more we can say about the movie so i think we'll end it there and since the winter olympics are going on right around when this comes out uh go out watch them i love olympics yeah you know what i've gotten into the last few olympics are the paralympics oh yeah so i know a lot of people there's certain events you like like, I, of course, I'm going to watch all of the hockey and I won't say a word the entire time because it is like life or death to me. But <laughs> a lot of the times, the fun thing about the Olympics is just watching things you never would see and be like, hmm, how about that? Yeah. I loved it. Most recently with the Summer Olympics, I watched a lot of those Paralympic ones and there's so many unique sports and you're like, wait, what's going on yeah. here? That's amazing. He's doing a bike with his hands. Let's see how this goes. I'm like... Like, I guess it's a Winter Olympic sport, but, like, sledge hockey. Sledge hockey is fun. And, like, some of those wheelchair sports and some of the, like, blind sports where they really do a good job of, like, equalizing the competition. Because, of course, disabilities are different for everybody. So some people may be, like, classified as blind, but you still may have some sight. Yeah. You may lack depth perception. There's certain ones where then you have color. to wear like a blockers so, on your Yeah. Head. So yeah, some yeah. people who are not 100% blind have to wear blockers. And I think that is so cool that we're like equaling the playing field in such an unequal kind of condition. Mm-hmm. Is blindness is like this huge range of different kinds of disability and this is so cool to see paralympics like you train and you do this and you're all the same on the playing field and there's lots of the same event in different classes Mm -hmm. depending on what the disability is so those are really fun but there's just so many unique sports and i think that's the draw for a lot of us in the olympics it's just like Hey, I've never seen this before. Yes. So you watch it. And there's and so many fun ones in the in the Paralympics. Exactly. So check those out as well. They're usually the week after the Olympics. Yep. And I love I love Olympics because I love to get into like really random sports that I like don't know or hear or care about for the rest of like the, the four years between Olympics. Oh, I wonder if the Jamaicans have a bobsled team this year. Oh, I don't know. We're recording this beforehand, so I haven't even looked. Are you going to be more interested in the bobsled after watching this? Oh, I love bobsled just like regularly. And so I don't know how I didn't see this movie and how I like didn't know this entire story from the beginning. Because I do a lot of like Wikipedia and like Google during the Olympics just to like see if anything exciting happened in those sports. And I don't know how I missed this one. So even though it's a Disney movie and I should have just known. Yeah. (laughs) Well, now you all know too. Cool Runnings is the best. I agree. Is this a rare double love? This is a rare double love. Nice. Love, love. I feel like we should like high five. 
The second sponsor of our podcast is Alberta Treasury Ranch and their podcast, The Future of Podcast, hosted by Todd Hirsch, ATB Financial's Vice President and Chief Economist. The Future of Podcast has launched its third season by connecting with industry leaders to uncover what's on the horizon for the things that mean the most to you. The Future of Podcast promises to give you insights to help navigate what is often an uncertain future. Explore how our economy and communities can not only brace for change, but embrace the opportunity it creates. Subscribe to The Future Of on the Apple Podcasts and Google Play, Spotify, and wherever you're listening to our podcast. And connect with them at atb.com slash future of. And you can check us out on all of those, of course. Rate and review and subscribe. We always forget to tell people yes, to do that. Yes, please do those things. <laughs> yeah, it matters. <laughs> One I'll episode read them is not enough. And I'll be happy. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see us back here next week where we will each have a thing of the week, something that we're interested in. And Samantha will let us know where, what we're watching for the Big Watch after that. And we're starting February next week. So we will be doing romantic picks. Are we? I am. <laughs> oh, well, last time in February that I remember was you were like, oh, romantic, Gone with the Wind. And then after that travesty, I had to see like, no, February, Black History Month. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, we can do Black History Month. So we will see you back next week when I reveal what movie we will be watching for the first February pick. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. We should have been like, and until next time, feel the rhythm, feel the rhyme, give it up. It's podcast time. <laughs> I love this. You should do. <laughs>